they told me to bring two hats tonight, and I've got them here. Uh, this is one from Sea Air Pacific, where I did my float plane rating, which was a ton of fun. And this is my castle one. So the first bit I'm going to be talking to is going to have the sea in one. Well, I'm not going to wear it. That's who I am at the moment. I'm an industry person. We've moved on from the part of the evening where we were talking about um, concrete things, I suppose, air traffic control and um, MET and the airport, things flying around the airport. We're now moving into the area of where we're going to be delving into human factors issues. It's a sad fact that, as Tim alluded to, a loss of control entry uh, or an entry into uh, IMC via VFR pilot and the subsequent loss of control is nearly always a fatal event, often a fatal event. They still continue to occur and we still keep trying to do something about it, but it's a difficult subject to get hold of because it's a human factors issue. Those human factors are difficult to nail down and <coughs> difficult to do things about. We're here tonight because we're having a go and because we're going to keep having a go at doing something about these human factors. The aviation landscape is fairly different to when I learned to fly and became a commercial pilot. It's become clear to everyone that there are really not many old and bold mentors around in the GA industry anymore. The airlines have sucked away all those experienced people. When I learned to fly in 74, there were 10 instructors at the school, the lowest experienced one had 1,000 hours, and the boss had about 15,000 hours. The guy who taught me to fly and sent me to solo had 10,000 hours. Those sorts of people just aren't around anymore in the training industry. And unfortunately, they're often not around in small GA organisations. So that valuable mentoring that was available then isn't readily available now. That's just a fact of life and there's not much we can do about it. Like I say to plenty of people, if it was possible for us to develop a vaccine or a, a drug or a, some sort of implant that we could give all that accumulated experience of everyone in the aviation industry and just inject it into them, and they will all have it from day one, we would solve a whole lot of this human factor stuff. But that's just not going to happen whilst we have aircraft with crew on them. So experience levels are down across the board. Mentors aren't readily available. But unfortunately, experience is sometimes the only way to get a handle on some things. You've got to actually have to experience it to determine whether it's whether you can do it, how, how dangerous it might be, and what you could do about avoiding getting into trouble with it. But we can't just go and send you off and fly in the clouds to find out how bad they are. It just doesn't work like that. We can't have people continuing to push the boundary to get closer and closer to an event. That's just not going to work. So what we're going to try and do is just instill a little snippet of something from this type of forum, which you may be able to take away with you. Peter and the team are going to work on a toolkit which is going to look at the hazards that we've identified. And what we're going to try and do against those hazards is when we eventually send this out to you or deliver a product to you, is to give you some strategies on how you might address those hazards and stop them becoming a real risk. Because while they're on the board and sitting up there, there's still a hazard like the hole in the runway. They don't become a risk until you actually interact with it. Now, I was asked to uh, talk about something that happened in my past um, in order to give you the I learned something from that lecture. Not really a lecture, but it's not really clear whether I learned something from that at the time or not. But looking back a long time ago, I will just go through what happened and let you think for yourself about what the risks, what the hazards were, and, well, you'll see for yourself. The reason we look back at stuff 
is that. There's been a few paraphrases of that. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. <coughs> More simply put, learn from the mistakes, because if we don't know those mistakes, we might make the same one. So one way for our industry is to be informed of history that's important to us as pilots. Unfortunately, the place you find that is accident reports. Even if you read every one there was, you wouldn't have a full picture. But if you did read every one that was out there, particularly in Australia, maybe in the not top end, or even if you drilled down to just weather-related accidents, there's an astonishing number of them. And they've got depressingly similar things in them. And we'll get to that at the end of my talk. So this is a repainted version of the aircraft involved. So the time is 1980. It was my second flying job. I uh, learned to fly at Bankstown. I did an instructor's rating after my commercial, and I did a bit of instructing with the company that uh, gave me my training. And then I got a job at Maruya. Maruya's on the south coast of New South Wales, a beautiful seaside town. I hadn't had much charter experience, probably 20 hours maybe. At the time of this incident in this particular aircraft, I had 480 hours. About 150 instructing and about 50 charter. I didn't have an instrument rating. But let me tell you, I knew everything. <laughs> I was shit hot. <laughs> I was hired by the Aero Club and I was the only pilot in town with a commercial license. There were a couple of pilots. So I was the one they looked at. Those years we had this, this aeroplane was built in about 1979, so it was only a year old, beautiful. It was a different colour, but it had, everything was nice, like the plastic on the seats. And I loved flying it. So I was the one to do a charter. So the job was from Maria over to Tumen. Now, those of you who know that country, Tumen is in the Snow Mountains. Uh, it's over the other side of the Great Dividing Range, but it's only 100 miles from uh, Maria, so it's not a real big deal. The people who wanted to go there were some high-powered locals. I can't recall what they were in, but they might have been real estate people or stock and station people, something like that. But they wanted to go there. They were paying a fair bit of money to do it. I had to take them there. I don't recall the forecast. It was probably all right. But the fact that I don't recall it probably means I didn't pay much attention to it. However, one of the clients friends said, oh yeah, the weather's fine at Chum. No problem at all. So I'm right, good to go. So being a good charter pilot, um, wanting to save money, I just drew a line from Maria. This is a new charter, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Not the charter at the time. Uh, off I was running. So this is, the, this is the line I drew on the map. And you'll see that there's a bit of terrain here and Right here, this is Canberra here, and there's the, there's the destination. What could go wrong with that? Looks like that's straight, straight on. So, the day came, we took off, climbed up, the Cessna 206 climbed pretty well, so I'm heading off in the direction of Tumut. I knew the area originally well, I'd flown around it a bit, been there a couple of months, like four months or something. Um, so, I'm flying out there and there's some cloud. Yeah, okay. Well, it's on the coast, there's always going to be a bit of cloud. So inevitably, as I got closer to the hills and climbed higher, the cloud started to come down a little bit. Or I suppose I got closer to the cloud. I need to set the scene for 1980. In 1980, people, VFR pilots going into controlled airspace was not routine. There was some sort of a, a mindset that we didn't call ATC to get a clearance. There was some sort of mindset that the controlled airspace was reserved for IFR jets. So, in the back of your mind, oh, well, we, don't, we really avoid controlled airspace, so I never considered going direct to Canberra, for instance, and then going over there. I just said, no, no, I'll give that a miss and I'll just skirt around the edge of the control. So I climbed up to a height that would keep me clear of the ground, I thought, but the clouds started to get thicker. I did some sort of left and right weaving here, 
to stay in some low country, but the cloud was still getting thicker, but I, I kept going. I could deal with it. I was the gun pilot from an area. Um, I've got no problems. So I found myself flying up a valley, somewhere around here, and the cloud got thicker and thicker and the vis was poor, there was a bit of rain. I thought, oh well, I knew where I'm going. And over the other side of these hills here is this low country, so all I've got to do is get past this little bit and all will be well. Be good. Edge of here. <laughs> However then, of course, the inevitable happened. And that visibility turned into cloud, straight in. It's hard to recall what I did then, but what I do believe I did, I just froze. I sat there. Fortunately, when I sat there and froze, I was looking at the attitude of Nicola. That previous uh, the, uh, video showed the person looking outside. If I was looking outside, I would likely to have been like that. If for some reason, I was looking at the attitude indicator. And I kept looking at that attitude indicator. I, I presume any of you who have been in a stressful situation realise that your vision narrows. You get tunnel vision, you only see something straight in front of you. You don't know what's going on there. The passengers could have been screaming, they could have been doing anything. Don't know. All I could see was the attitude indicator. And all I did was keep that attitude indicator level. I knew how to fly instruments, I had a little bit of instrument time. I did, had a bit of instructing under my belt too. It took about a minute. I thought I stayed level. Turned out I didn't. But in about one minute, I popped out and I'm out here. I more than likely clicked the edge of that control zone. And as it turns out later, I wasn't exactly where I was. Well, one of the things that struck me and has struck me in later years, I've never really had any conscious thought processes. I don't recall ever thinking about turning back. I don't even recall thinking about climbing up in the cloud or climbing above it and asking for clearance. I don't believe any of those things cross my mind. After I ended in the cloud, all rational decision making went out the window. I was a passenger. I was trapped looking at the attitude indicator. So if you think about what the accident report might have read, if we'd have smacked into the hill or lost control, it would have said what it usually says. The aircraft was probably serviceable. It had sufficient fuel for the flight. The pilot was licensed and had a proper medical. The aircraft was loaded to within its weight and balance limitation. The aircraft was equipped for VFR flight. The pilot did not have an instrument. Plan. The pilot planned a straight line across very high country without even thinking about going another way. The forecast indicated that VFR flight was possible, but there were problems with cloud. And the end of the accident report in those days would have read something like, the reasons for the poor decision making of the pilot not turning around or avoiding the weather could not be determined. And that used to appear on just about every weather related accident report, and it still does. It turned out that I wasn't quite where I thought I was. When I came back that afternoon, it was nice and shiny. I realised that I was over here somewhere. And I was at about 5,000. 500 feet on a VFR altimeter in a Cessna 206 in the cloud. Who knows how close we come? So what did I learn? Well, on that day I didn't learn anything. I landed at Tumut, I went and did their business. The weather improved, got back in the plane, flew home. I didn't talk to anyone about it. Didn't have a partner. Had a few friends, had a beer at the pub, but didn't talk to them about this, couldn't talk to them about that. Didn't have another pilot and person there to talk to. 
being a young gun pilot, self-introspection isn't my strong suit when, in 1980. I'm probably not much better now, but then I was hopeless. I just saw the world as a big, bright, shiny ball and I was flying around and having fun. It wasn't, did I do something wrong? Did I make a decision or did I not make a decision? Did I expose people to dying or anything like that? That didn't cross my mind. And even so, that sort of thing is quite difficult to share and quite individual. And it's not until you mature a bit do you realise that you can talk about that and express it and perhaps get something out of it. So what can we do? We've got to find a way that these sorts of experiences, which almost wrote myself and four people off, don't get learned by bitter experience. It's like the cliff diving thing. I'll keep diving a bit higher off the cliff until I really break something. We can't keep doing it. So what we've got to do, if we can't develop that vaccine, stop people going in these sorts of situations. We've got to develop some strategies. We can help, but as you can see from this scenario, a lot of it is entirely personal. You're the one making the decisions or not. In this case, I didn't make many at all. I just kept going. That was really simple. Turning around and going back might have been a bit harder. So what I'm putting out to you there is this accident would have been a purely human factors accident. It would have been depressingly the same as other accidents. It wouldn't have been any different to all those other hundreds that are out there. It didn't happen to me at 500 hours. I got through it. But we can't discount the possibility that someone in this room might find themselves in this same situation again <coughs> in the future. Now, these forums are one way of getting this information across in a way where we can openly talk about it. And if you can openly talk about it, someone else can learn from it. 